Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I forgot to check with our camera folks. You ready? Okay. Good. Thanks. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Nashville MTA board meeting. And um, we get to welcome someone new again this month. A. Ron Thompson, welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Well, we're glad to have you. And is there anything you want to share with us before we get started? I just um, put you on the spot, but... No, I'm excited to learn and listen and and put my two cents in where I think it's needed. Well, we're we're looking forward to that two cent plus a little more. So I I I know everybody can't see this, but I really want to applaud Aaron for understanding the brand on his first meeting. He has on very cool gym shoes with purple swish swash. I don't know and purple shoelaces what can we say about that he knows about we go already so i'm excited <laughs> awesome 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 and catherine welcome back came last month and came back so welcome welcome glad, glad to have you and, and and i'd be remiss if i didn't say a moment about walter cersei who rode off our board. Walter gave just tremendous, tremendous insight to us as a board and to MTA. He will be missed, but he is always a friend who's going to hang out with us whenever we call him. And uh, I'm excited about that because I think with his expertise and his commitment and his love of transit, that having a good friend like that is incredible. And we will find a time in the near future to celebrate uh, all that uh, Walter means to us here at MTA we go. So Walter, if you're watching, are you watching Walter? If you're watching, we miss you and we thank you. So thank you. So let me do roll call right quick. Jessica Dolphin. Present. Catherine Sasser. Present. Aaron Thompson. Present. And Gail Carr Williams. Present. Janet is not with us today, uh, but I'm certain she is with spirits. See, that's her, you know, ringing us in right now. So she's probably watching too. Uh, <laughs> so, first on the agenda is the approval of the July 27th uh, MTA board minutes. If I can have a motion for approval. Motion to approve. There's a motion for approval. Uh, if I can have a second. Second. Uh -huh. Mentoring going on over there. <laughs> I think because you had many first last month. No way. That is amazing. So I have a a motion and a second, and I would ask if there are any questions, comments, additions, or deletions to the minutes. Hearing none, I will call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. We have minutes. Thank you very much. Um, next on the agenda, we have public comments. I have one card, and the card is from uh, Darius Knight. And I'll just remind um, our public comments that we have three minutes for public comments. Good afternoon, Mr. Knight. Okay. Good afternoon. <clears throat> um. My public comments, kind of a mixture. Um, I've come to this board relaying information about issues with uh, quality and control. And only as of recently, thanks to Zeta Riggs and her customer service managers, have I gotten the response that I should have gotten since February. I've talked to multiple other customers who've had this problem and I keep pushing them to just call instead of emailing because the representatives seem to have a better attitude. Um, I hope that quality and control is able to get that sorted. I can only ask of you all to please add another person to their department uh, to help Brian, Georgina, and the other young lady who's working hard. Um, I want to bring attention to your customers. Um, your operation staff has been frustrated dealing with a lot because of the Broadway bridge close. And these operators, uh, I got to give it to them. They've been on their A game. Some issues have arose up, which I've reported, but 
I would just say to you all, the next time there's a bridge closure, please ask the city, state, whomever to give y'all bus lanes temporarily so that you can get your customers to and where they need to be. Um, we understand it's not Charles' fault for this, but at the same time, kind of be a voice for the people. Um, that would say something to your customers. The other thing I would like to say concerning other issues that I've brought up in the past, I noticed in the packet information, reading it online, and <laughs> I personally took it as it was directed towards me because I'm the only one that comes to this meeting every single month passionate enough where I've reported this through customer comments where I'm even either having to do this or to raise my voice to get my point across. I'm going to say this to you all. I'm not trying to keep you from doing your job because I understand that you all volunteer to do what you're doing. But I want to remind you what happened in our state house just a few months ago. Let's not repeat what the Tennessee state legislature did because then that will be sending a message to your customers that their opinion their thoughts do not matter. It shouldn't matter if somebody shows their emotion. That means that they're dedicated. It's the ones that don't show any emotion that you should be concerned of. So with that being said, think about what you're saying and what you're doing when you come up with these rules. And it's not a personal attack on anyone. But if I have an issue and I've directed it via customer comments and it was never addressed, then I want to make it known at this board meeting. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Mr. Knight. I don't have any more cards for public comments. Is there anyone else that wishes to make a public comment? Is there anyone else that wishes to make a public comment? Hearing none, I will close the public comment section of our agenda at this time. Thank you. Next on our agenda is information only items. We have three items in that for the board's review. I'd ask, do any of the board members wish to have any of them removed and have discussion about it at this time? Hearing no requests for that, I just would uh, ask that everyone really do take the time to read them. And if you have any more questions later, please reach out to the staff member that prepared the report or to Steve to make certain you have everything you need. We have no consent, no consent agenda items today, so uh, I will move on to our Operations and Finance Committee, and I will welcome Jessica as the new chair of Operations and Finance Committee. I know you made a run at it last month and did extremely well, so uh, now that it's all yours, I'll turn it over to you, Jessica. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I now can convene the Operations and Finance Committee. Uh, we have two discussion items and one action item before us today. Beginning with um, discussion item OF-D-23-004, which is an overview of the FTA triennial, triennial review final report um, with Billy Higgins and um, Nick Oldham. Thank you, Jessica. Nick is not able to be here this afternoon, so you just get me. Um, I am grateful for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about what our organization accomplished over the last six months. Um, it, the Triennial Review is something that FTA comes and does as part of oversight it's every three years. The last time they came was in 2019. There's a, if you do the math, and they're a little bit off, but that was one of the benefits of the pandemic. We got one year to get a little bit of an extra head start. And, all. Um, and so I want to talk to you. In your packets is the report. I'll t talk about it just briefly. I want to talk about the process. Um, so we spend, as soon as the last, as soon as the 2019 review wrapped up, we were in the process of preparing for the next one. It's an ongoing process. What FTA does in these reviews is not an audit. They skim the surface, but they do. It feels like they're pulling at weeds when we're in the nick in the thick of it during the last this last six months. Um, but that preparation comes to height 
comes to light in these last six months. They look at a lot of documents. In November, they reach out to Steve and myself and say, hey, your, your review is up. Um, these are the materials that we need. And they give us about two months to do the initial batch of materials. Um, so we send our, I reach out to all my staff and I, my staff, <laughs> they become my staff during trying to review. <laughs> I actually delegate executive authority to Billy during that period. So um, everybody raise your hand if you responded to an email from me. <laughs> so it wasn't just me, it was a team effort. Every department in this organization contributes something to this. Um, we have a lot of different areas that FTA looks into. Um, so that first batch of documentation is sent for review. They, the contractors look at it. They talk with our regional office staff. Our region four staff is very on top of what we're doing. They reach out and touch base with me and the contractor and say, well, what about this or what about this? And then a couple of weeks later, we get another request for more information and more documentation. Um, in the end, at the end of May, I tallied up how many documents I submitted, and it was over 1,000 documents. That's, and that's just the, the file. Some of those documents contain 200 or 300 pages. Some of those documents were just a one, a one sentence. But it was a lot of materials to review and go back and forth on. It accumulates in way they did a um, virtual site visit the last week of May, um, meeting with each one of the departments key staff in reviewing what was submitted and answering the questions in their book. And they have a set notebook that's 700 pages long that they're answering. A, they're putting a sentence in for each one of those questions. Um, in the end, they looked at 15 grant awards, 14 financial draws, nine procurements, several different project management files, um, a lot of other documentation. And we came up with um, one deficiency. Um, so kudos to us and my team for uh, pulling all this together. Uh, for reference, just for reference, in 2019, there were eight deficiencies in, the, in four of the areas. And they look at over 20 areas every, every three years. Um, in FY22 nationwide, the average was 5.5 deficiencies. Um, so kudos to us for making that way. The deficiency that was found was in our drug and alcohol department. It was an oversight of our contractors. We have submitted corrective action, and they are in the process of reviewing it, and they will give us feedback on that. Um, that, that concludes a brief overview of the process itself. I'm happy to any, answer any questions. Are there any questions for Billy? I don't have a question, but just a comment. I, I was going to ask about the previous um, review and report and how many deficiencies and congratulations to you and, and everyone. I think one is amazing and mm -hmm. the sharp decrease from the previous one is is just a testament to how much work must have gone into it. So congratulations. Agreed. Thank you. And I'll add just a couple of minutes. First of all, um, Billy is one of our superstars. She's one of the people. There, there are a few who I have always said that please decide to retire two years ahead of time so I can retire one year after you tell me uh, and the year before you leave. Uh, but really an incredible job, and she is extremely well respected by our Federal Transit Administration folks and people all over the state. Um, I've been asked for help from time to time with other transit agencies, and we've had to send in Billy to try to fix um, some of their issues. So really an incredible effort. And to her comments, it really is a team effort. Um, last time, I don't think she's here today, uh, Denise Henderson, yeah. procurement is one of our, is one of the major areas that they look at, as you might well imagine. It was a significant area where we had findings last time around. And it is extremely rare for anybody to get through that process without a single finding. Yeah. But if there was one, you know, if I had to pick out one superstar function is probably in the procurement area because believe me i'm, I'm yeah. going to bet out of those thousand documents probably 400 of them from procurement. Uh, were relative to procurement so and speaking to the drug and alcohol unfortunately nick was unable to be here today but essentially in our corrective action plan there were really two items one is all of our contractors all of our operational contractors fall under the same federal drug and alcohol rules that we do in terms of pre-employment testing for drugs and alcohol random testing, post-accident, et cetera, et cetera. 
and generally the contractors are in compliance, but we didn't, it's what I would refer to as a paper finding. Um, even though they're using the same uh, medical review officers, blood alcohol technicians that we are, they did not have a document that showed what their certifications were. So, so I think that issue's already been addressed. Yes. And then frankly, we just fell short a little bit on our testing rates, our random testing rates for both drug and alcohol. You're required to do 50% of your workforce every year for drug, 25% for alcohol. We had some turnover in the, in the HR department, so we had a couple handoffs drop, but um, Nick and Andy and Carolyn and, and the gang are, um, you know, are addressing that. And one of the corrective actions I warned was uh, I'm going to get a report every month on what our polls were and, and who complied. And so far for three months, we've been we've been in great shape. So um, so I'm, I have every confidence that that will not be a finding next time around. Thank you. Um, as a board member, reading through the report, because there's a letter to the chair, uh, Ms. Gail Williams, and is detailing um, the findings that were, you know, not deficient, not deficient. I felt so proud reading through that. And it was also really um, encouraging to me as a board member and as a uh, transit advocate in the community to see all of the um, updates and upgrades and things that we've done since 2019 because they're listed um, in this packet. Uh, so it was just really eye-opening. I really appreciate all the work that you and all the teams have been doing. This is really great. Um, and for that, I. I'm going to say to Madam Chair that the, oh, it's a discussion item. We don't have to vote. No, we don't. Oh, Thank you, Billy. a great discussion it item. It was a great discussion <laughs> item. Brilliant. Um, so the next discussion item we have. Billy, good job, as, as always. Thank you. Yeah, that's a long report. It's always a me. good letter to receive. That's the action item. Can we play some music while I find this? Okay. So the next discussion item is OF-D-23-005 on page 40 of your book. And this is the quarterly root performance report by Katie Freudberg. Good afternoon. Um, welcome new members. Um, today I'll be reviewing the quarterly performance report for April through June of 2023. Um, once again, this was our highest ridership quarter that we've seen um, since the start of the pandemic. 6% um, higher than last quarter, so we're still seeing that growth continue. Um, we had five routes this time, uh, the 8 8th Avenue, 18 Airport, 52 Nolensville Pike, 55 Murfreesboro Pike, and 23 Dickerson Road that were um, above and some of them well above pre-COVID levels. Um, as well as five um, additional routes that were 90% or more of, of their pre-COVID ridership. Um, you'll notice that of those five routes that are over pre-COVID ridership, four of them are kind of to the south of downtown. Um, so today I want to talk a little bit about an area of slower growth, which is North Nashville. Um, so you may notice that some of the routes there, um, especially the routes that are planned to serve the new North Nashville Transit Center, um, the 9 Metro Center, 14 Whites Creek, 22 Bordeaux, 42 St. Cecilia, um, have seen relatively slow ridership growth compared to other routes. Um, most of them are around 60 or 70% of pre-COVID ridership still. Um, some of this is something that started even before COVID, likely due to changing demographics, um, as well as just faster growth in other parts of, of the city. Um, but with the Metro budget for this year, we'll have a substantial amount of additional service allocated towards this part of town. Um, so we've started doing a round of onboard engagement, you know, first just getting kind of people's thoughts about what works right now. Um, what do you want to see in the future for your route? You know, what, what do you want to keep? What do we need to do with this additional funding that we have? Um, and we're hoping that we can use that information to go back with, um, with a couple of concepts for people to comment on in the next few months. Um, with, you know, the goal to maintain or improve access for people who are already using the route. Um, and then to, you know, create um, new connections, improve travel times, um, better access to different parts of the city that will also help attract um, more passengers to those routes in, in that part of the city. Um, and those changes um, are, are planned to take place um, in spring of 2024 when the North National Transit Center opens. Um, 
And then uh, I just want to call your attention to two areas of really strong growth that we saw this quarter, um, Route 18 Airport and Route 77 Thompson Wedgwood. Um, we added service to both of these routes in April, and we saw a, an immediate return on it um, of over 20% on both of them, matching or exceeding the amount of service that we added to them, um, which is pretty exciting. Um, also probably an, indi an indicator of latent demand and that there's probably demand for, for more in those areas, um, especially the Route 18. Um, you know, looking at service to the airport is going to have to be a key part of the Murfreesboro BRT study. Um, and that concludes my report, unless anybody has any questions. Thank you, Katie. Um, any questions for Katie Freudberg and quarterly performance report? Any follow-up from Steve? Just one. I mean, I'm surprised Katie didn't mention it, but you'll also see we had a continuing deterioration in our on-time performance, thanks to among other things, Broadway Bridge, but um, certainly that's not the only culprit uh, when it comes to some of our slow moving. So we'll continue to work with the city and TDOT and others to try to develop various approaches to transit priority. Frankly, if we don't get it, it's going to be really hard to generate sustained ridership growth. Um, so. You're welcome, Katie. Thank you. I did put that. I, I did put that in the written part. Um, I will say that some of these declines were so precipitous that I checked the data in hopes that we had data issues going on, and unfortunately, that was not the problem. Okay. Thank you, I, Steve. Thank you for that update because I had in my notes to ask that question, um, but you addressed it, and you, Katie, you addressed all the questions I had written <laughs> in your report. So, thank you for that. I I, I just want to note that I it's again so encouraging to be what the only city or one of the only cities that has recovered so fast um, to pre-pandemic ridership. Um, that is just wonderful. And I think to your point, I, we're looking at some latent demand and offering more services, more frequent routes, um, obviously helps. Whoa. Okay. That was a discussion item. Thank you, Katie. And, um, now. I wonder if they can hear us in the other room too. <laughs> How fun. Uh, okay, so we have a board action item, M-A-2, dash dash test test, dash 23-023 dash on page 40. <laughs> Maybe we can give them just a couple Okay, just give them a minute, to, okay. I know they went next door to talk to them, so yeah. maybe we can figure this out. We never have company here. Yeah. <laughs> Are you all okay on your mics? Are you all okay? Well, we'll just we'll keep rolling and we'll just talk through it. Okay. Everybody's I think we're good. good with that. So, um, two three dash zero two three, page forty two, and this is. Um, 40 foot clean diesel bus purchase and Carl Rokos is going to lead us through that. Go ahead, Carl. All right. Um, Madam Chair, members of the board, new members, test, test. Um, concurrent with our efforts, MTA, um, to operate within our capital fleet plan for 40 foot buses, staff request to enter into a five year contract with Gillig Corporation for the acquisition of 40 foot clean diesel buses. And to purchase an initial 28 buses with that contract. Um, authorization of this purchase will be consistent with the agency's effort, efforts to uh, execute a more balanced schedule for capital spending and fleet replacement. Considering the lead time for the production schedule, staff anticipates delivery dates for these 28 vehicles in 2024, late 2024. Um, the request for a proposal was published on WeGo's website in Transit Talent, which is a trade magazine um, website. And there were three proposers, two of them bid on it. One of them got out, Nova Bus, Gillig, New Flyer. Nova backed out um, due to, um, they, they sent a letter that said they were backing out of 
the bid due to they're not going to build buses for the North American market now. So unfortunately, that that was what it was. The evaluation committee um, found Gilly to be the most advantageous, demonstrating their capability to meet the agency's delivery schedule and bus specifications. Gilly responded with the best and final offer on July 17, 2023, with a cost savings and improvement or improved delivery schedule. Um, WeGo's third party inspector, First Transit, has conducted the required pre purchase audit to validate that the overall bus components with federal requirements meet a minimum of 70% um, American built content and final assembly requirements, proving the compliance with Buy America, Buy America requirements. Um, when production is completed, First Transit will perform um, post delivery inspections. Um, and confirm the Buy America content or requirements are met. So staff is re recommending that the board provide the chief executive officer authority to approve a five-year contract with Gilly LLC and authority to supply the agency with 40-foot clean diesel transit coaches and to execute an initial purchase order for the purchase of 28 40-foot buses from Gilly Corporation for vehicles used in fixed route service. The request, requested contract authorization is not to exceed a price of $656,739 per bus, plus an additional $12,000 per bus for tools and training. The total not to exceed authorization for this acquisition is $18,724,692. The overall five-year contract ceiling is for a not to exceed amount of $50 million. Staff will return to the board in future years for specific authorizations to acquire equipment under the remainder of this contract. Funding for this acquisition is already in place with $8,180,000 um, in Metro Nashville capital spending and the $10,704,000 thousand dollar in federal 5307 formula funding with matching state and local funds so thank you carl are there any questions for carl uh, this is i think a point of curiosity but what what do we do with the retired buses where we, do they go we disposition them and they either go into a contingency fleet or you know growth or expansion or we retire them and put that we market them basically put them on the website uh gov deals or ebid and sell them oh, okay carl let's see um to that because they don't tend to have a whole lot of residual value despite the upfront price tag on average when we retire a bus how many miles would you guess are, are on it 500 600 thousand thank you carl any further questions Hey, one question. So how many are we retiring? We're bringing on this new 28. We're going to retire 16. Um, and there'll be 12 expansion vehicles. And that's for the, the expanded service we're going to have in April. Okay. Yes, because we need more buses if we're going to add more frequent routes or longer, longer yeah. service hours, right? Right. Typically, like when we expand service hours or we would add to service during off peak hours, we can deal with it with the existing fleet. But when we're adding on top of our peak service requirement, we need additional vehicles. So all the service expansion, this next phase that Katie talked about and that Carl's referencing with this purchase is all part of our better bus initiative that was incorporated into the 2020 Metro Nashville transportation plan. And that's been the basis of our sub, uh, budget submissions to the mayor's office and the Metro Council. And this time around, um, in the capital spending plan, they authorized us the $8.2 million for expansion fleet. And they also gave us about $5.5 million for this next wave of, of service expansion and that actual operating dollars to operate that service. Brilliant. I'm, I'm really pleased to see that we already have the funding and we know that procurement of buses has been an issue in the past. So um, I love seeing that they'll, they'll be on schedule. Thanks. It is the recommendation of the Operations and Finance Committee to the full board um, to make a motion to 
approve this action. The purchase of 40, uh, no, 28 40 foot clean diesel buses. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jessica. So is that a motion? It is. If I can have a second. Second. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, I will call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All the buses made coming. Thank you. I'm sorry, it's a little girl. I never would have thought that new buses would excite me. <laughs> Oh, how we evolve. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> I think that concludes you. Oh, that's right. This concludes the Operations and Finance Committee, and I now turn it back over to Chair Hale. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Great job. Thank you. Lots of good stuff going on in your committee. So thank you. Um, in Janice's absence, I'll sort of run through the new initiatives and community engagement committee. I... Uh, and first, I'll call up Felix to talk about the fair policy. Hi, Felix. Hello. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Welcome, Aaron, which I ran into uh, coming in and I had to look up to hear his name. Um, welcome. It's, it's good to see you all. Um, so, uh, unless uh, you didn't know, we have a new fair collection system uh, called Quick Ticket. And and, uh, you know, we've been working on this for a long time, and even before we officially launched it in early 2021, it's, it's been a, a, a long process, and it, it requires change. And anything we do, especially in this area, as we are changing the way that people are used to uh, pay their fares and utilize the system, it, it's a long process. It's challenging and has a lot of moving pieces, and it, it presents a new uh ways to, to think about and a new uh way for writers to embrace uh the the new system um and but the goals with with this and and you, you can see a lot of the details about where we've been with looking at the uh title six in in light of what we're doing with um with the fair policy and, and the new quick ticket system in your um in your package and i'll just give you a brief update but we thought it was uh, knowing that we, we're coming on a critical date on october 1st where we, we eliminated magnetics and uh, getting away from the transfer uh, or the change cards and not selling those on, on the on the third box on, on the buses anymore. It was important to come back and give uh, an update on where we've been with this since you last saw some of these policies that were brought to you uh, as far as they relate to Title VI. Um, just a quick reminder that, you know, the intention with this system is to make it simpler. And this is not only for the riders, but also for the operators. Sometimes this is one of the, uh, uh, Steve mentioned on time performance, if you've been to a, one of those high ridership uh, stops and you've seen the line of people as they get on the bus and the driver trying to, come on, come on, come on, it's not working, uh, uh, you know, my, it's not taking my cash. And so, you know, that also creates delays in, in the system as well. So it's not only for the customers, but, but for the operators as well. Uh, make it seamless, making sure that it's also equitable and people have access uh, to, to be able to access these products and how to obtain these, even for people that don't have uh, uh, a credit card or a smartphone or a, or a bank account and, and uh, revenue neutral to the degree possible. Um, in uh, June 2019, we brought to you some policies that were adopted by the board, uh, and some of those included different things, uh, but one of them was the, the discontinuation of the magnetic uh, media, including the paper transfers, change cards, and onboard sale of day passes um, uh, on the buses. Also, in February 2020, we brought you some additional uh, policies that were um, associated with introducing the account-based system so people can take benefit of those uh, discounts as they use the system. And those are laid out on, on the table provided in your item. Uh, and when we did that, we did a public outreach uh, process. We did a Title VI analysis. And although it, it, it was good for the most part, there were a couple of areas that we had some concerns. So looking at that, we outlined some mitigation strategies with, with the board at that time. Uh, and I'm going to just go over those real quick and tell you what the status of, of those, how we've been working with improving those that we identified earlier. Um, so one of those mitigation strategies was to continue the uh, selling the, the day passes on the bus for an overlapping period while we were introducing quick uh, ticket. And we did that since we officially launched quick ticket in 2021, all those uh, products remain available uh, and that over 
Labian period was about two and a half years when you think about when we introduced in 2021 and where we are now uh, getting ready to move that. Uh, secondly, we um, suggested, uh, implemented a fair capping for day passes. Uh, fair capping, we've dubbed that as uh, best value, and it's the ability of anybody that uh, once they reach what would account for the cost of a daily pass or a monthly pass, uh, so you don't get charged anymore if you continue to ride within that period of time. Um, so we did not only do that for daily passes, but we also did it for monthly passes. So that's been implemented. Um, third, implementing a temporary promotional incentives uh, for customer, uh, customers getting smart cards. We've been doing a lot of different um, uh, campaigns and promotional events and trying to get a uh, quick ticket in the, in the hands of, of riders and, and helping them to switch our um, cost, um, customer care department or communications or marketing. They've been running a lot of those efforts. And even now, as we can uh, prepare to do this transition, uh, there will be discounts in place available. Right now, if you utilize your store value account, you get half a fare, for example. Um, and through the end of the year, anybody that has change cards, they can turn those in and get, they're not going to lose that value that they have stored in those uh, change cards. They will get a, a quick ticket card with that uh, value on it. So they have until the end of the year to be able to do that. Um, fourth, uh, it was to pursue options for additional locations for reloading cards with less than $5 one time. Um, as part of this, we knew that we cannot keep asking people to go to Central and, and do those things there. So. Uh, uh, one of the strategies for this effort was to develop a comprehensive uh, network of retailers uh, where we can work with and people can go and get the products, they can uh, pay for it. If, if they have cash, they can pay with cash with them or they can load money into their carts. Uh, several partners are here uh, like CVS, Walgreens, Family Dollar uh, and 7-Eleven. There's, a, there's a different ones. But they can do that in the neighborhoods. They can do that near their places of employment or other places that they are around them that it doesn't imply or uh, necessitate for them to go to downtown and, and conduct that. So uh, the, the, the program keeps expanding, so we only see this network growing. Uh, we also identified um, the potential for building some partnerships with places like community um, centers or libraries. Those are a little bit more challenging as it requires resources and the staff that work at those places to be able to do that. So we continue to do that, but also, you know, it may open possibilities for ticket vending machines, for example, at some of those places where people can. So we continue to work on that. Uh, and lastly, uh, we said that rather than setting a specific date for the discontinu discontinuation of the current products that, uh, you know, we take into account that, um, on, uh, what, how that impact the disadvantaged populations and, and not do that until we saw that there was more of a market penetration and people transitioning to big ticket. So that was set in, in uh, February 2020. We had originally set up a date of the end of 2020 to do this transition. So again, here we are two and a half years later uh, moving with this decision. So uh, if we've given, you know, plenty of time in that and, and at the same time doing a lot of efforts to be able to um, assist the population and move them in that direction uh, and help them to be able to access these. But uh, I feel we are at a point now that for the system to work effectively, uh, we have to, you know, go to that next step where people are going to be able to continue and transition and, and, and get the, the benefits of, of the, pro of the uh, product and the process. Will you do some kind of, feel like some kind of marketing plan to let people know that it's coming to an end or is there a plan for that? Yeah, it's already in place. In fact, you're probably seeing signage yeah. all over the city. Okay. So I and on the web page and so. what have you. So including the fact that, you know, as of October 1st, you won't be able to get a paper transfer or, you know, or an onboard day pass or what have you. Now, having said that, <laughs> well, on October 1st, Zeta's phones will be ringing off the hook. I'm absolutely certain of it. And then the other element I'd add, we've had, we've seen steady increases in the penetration of, of quick ticket. I think we're up to maybe what, 55% of trips, Brian, somewhere in that. So we're over half the folks who are using it now. You know, and frankly, we're at the point we've had street teams and promotions and discounts. We're sort of at the point of, 
you know, based on our timeline, we probably, if we just kind of go with voluntary in, um, it will probably be sometime in the year 2078 um, <laughs> that we kind of phase it out. And people will still be able to use cash. So I think there's been a little bit of misinformation that no, you won't be able to use cash. You'll be able to use cash. We'll still accept, but it has to be exact change. It's a $2 fare. So you'll have to put $2 in the box and you'll have to pay every time you board the bus. So, you know, if you make a transfer to complete your trip, mm -hmm. um, you know, you'll pay $4 for that trip. And, that, and that's a good point, Steve, because uh, many of the systems that have been moving in this direction, uh, some of them have decided to go cashless. Uh, so we, we understand that that's not where we're going with this. Uh, so the ability to still pay with the cash at the at, you know, the third box is still going to be there. You just need to have exact change. But if you want to pay with cash, you have that option. While in other places, they're completely getting away with uh, paying with cash. Um, so, you know, just to, to recap, this has been, um, you know, Big changes take time, but as uh, Steve mentioned, I think we are at a point now that uh, if you expect people to do it voluntarily, as long as they have that option to continue to do what they have and it's always been done, that, you know, they probably won't move in that direction. Uh, but we will continue to monitor these. Uh, with the retail network, one of the things that we keep an eye on is those areas where we see higher ridership, where we see more of that uh, propensity for people that uh, use, to use transit to see whether there are any gaps and, and try to identify those and do some uh, auditing uh, as to you know, where we need to continue to expand those options for people. Uh, so none of that is going to go away. We just, if anything, we just want to make sure that it keeps increasing. Um, so that's, you know, that's a summary. Uh, as I mentioned, we're ready to move in, in um, October on October 1st with, with this. We felt it was uh, important to close the loop and, and on the Title VI and let you know that where we were with all those things, uh, mitigation strategies that we outlined and we said we were going to be doing additional work on that. So with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Also, we have uh, uh, Brian Williams, who's the, uh, overseeing the, the Quick Ticket project, if you have more specific questions about Quick Ticket. Yeah, thank, thank you, Felix. Um, I was curious about this too. I, I've been using Quick Ticket, but I'm, and I've been handing out Quick Tickets. And for those who writers who have aren't familiar with the card, um, it's been an educational process. Each and every card I've handed over to them. Um, I, I do have two questions for you. Uh, since we're still taking cash, we're, are we able to accept like Apple Pay when we get on the bus? Who would know not, this? not at this time. We are looking at options for including more of an open payment system. Okay. Because I've, I've gotten that question out and about, and I didn't yeah. know the answer, like Samsung and Apple phones, yeah. you know, pay by phone kind of thing. We're, we're looking at that, but uh, kind of linking into Felix's theme of, so, you know, change can happen really fast if it doesn't involve anybody. Um, <laughs> but when you're talking about changing human behavior, old habits die hard. So, frankly... Dan and Brian are chomping at the bit to work on open payment. And I said, let's just get through this first <laughs> and see how it goes. And then we'll sort of start moving in that direction. But also, I know I was going through a lot of the public comments, um, you know, that we'd seen through the service changes. And there was a recurring theme that really validates what Jessica's saying, which is, oh, when I first went on a quick ticket, it was so confusing. And I had to, and, but now it's so simple and mm -hmm. it's the best way to go. And I don't know mm -hmm. why I didn't do it years ago. So, as I've said to our folks and I've said to some of our elected officials, just, you know, smile um, when people are screaming at you in October and November and by December, January, um, it should be a non-event. Yeah, change is hard. I get it. And this is a big change. Um, my next question for you, Felix, is you mentioned that you have this network of retailers that folks can go to uh, to purchase these these cards and or reload value if they don't have an app or what a phone to do it. Um, is there a resource so we can see where those are, like a, a website with a yeah, map I or there's signs at these places? We have that available on our website, and there's a map that shows you what the different uh, retailers are. Um, and do we have the uh, bus routes over imposed on that? I'm not sure. Hannah, you may know. Yeah. Yeah, so, so if you are a writer of the system, you can see where your route goes and you can see what locations um, are near you and where you can uh, access that. Awesome. If you just go to the Thank quick you. ticket section of the web page, it'll kind of lead you right into that. Thank you. Or 
our major um, companies that have high ridership, has there been an outreach to them to kind of push the message that in October we will be uh, discontinuing? The I can I can address that actually. So in this stage conversion, um, our our the program you're talking about, Iran, is called We Go Ride. It's our old Easy Ride program, which is the corporate sponsorship program. And that was one of the groups we had fully converted over to Quick Ticket early on. So if you're getting your, you know, your monthly pass through Vanderbilt or, you know, any other company or any other uh, WeGo Ride sponsor, you're already, you're already kind of in that. You're in that 55 percent or so. They're already using Quick Ticket. Great job, Felix. Thank you. I remember when we tried that charge car for a little bit. Remember? Yeah. Yeah, they were all empty. Uh -huh. <laughs> Technology has progressed. It didn't. Just it a tad didn't. We since, have uh, progressed. Yeah. Up there, I can't remember what year it was, but I do remember we tried to charge cards and you didn't get instant approval. So, um, but yes, yes, that was, that was. A good memory. Well, not really. <laughs> when you looked at lost revenue, it wasn't. But I do remember that. So yeah. So so hearing this today is really progress, and I think it's really meeting the needs of so many of our uh, Nashvilleians. So thanks, and thanks for the update, and thanks for pushing it to be where it it can be. Um. So access improvement plan, Dan. Welcome, Dan. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. So I am going to be going over uh, recommendations uh, that stem from the access improvement study that uh, WeGo has been working with in partnership with our consultant team, KFH, for the last uh, couple of years now. Um, and that study was a comprehensive review of the entire access program uh, and associated services. So it wasn't just it, paratransit was a large focus, but there was, had a broader focus as well. Um, overall, the goals of the project, there's a summary um, in page, on page 47 in the printed booklet. But if I had to boil that down into one sentence, it's essentially to improve overall customer experience and service options while also maintaining or increasing service efficiency. This April, uh, we provided a project update that also included potential changes to both the access paratransit and access on demand programs. And today, we'll be looking at the final policy recommendations that stem from those early discussions. Uh, but before we look at the specific recommendations, I'd like to give a quick overview of the different demand response services that are currently offered by WeGo, because it can be a little confusing. There's a, there's a few different services. And then also, I want to review the uh, feedback that we received from customers during the outreach part of this process. So we have three primary um, demand response programs, and those are Access, Access On Demand, and WeGoLink. Access is our ADA-required paratransit service for customers with disabilities that prevent them from using traditional fixed route service. The users will uh, book trips currently over the phone uh, or via email um, from one location to another. They have to specify those locations and who's going to be traveling with them. Uh, and then they receive a 30-minute pickup window when they can expect the vehicle to arrive. And those trips have to be booked at least one day in advance. There's no same-day reservations on that program. It's a flat fare of $3.70. And then service that service is provided both by uh, our drivers and vehicles as well as a few third-party providers that we have that provide service on our behalf. Access on Demand is another service that's specifically for access eligible customers. And it's a customer choice program in which riders book trips directly with their provider of choice. So it's a little bit different. Instead of calling us, our call center, they're, they're calling the provider themselves, the ones that they're choosing to ride with. Uh, they choose, customers generally use Access on Demand to save time through faster trips. They do not have a pickup window and rides can be booked same day as used two hours in advance. The fare's a little bit different though. It's $7 and then a dollar per mile for every mile beyond 14 miles for any given trip. WeGoLink 
is an, also an on-demand program, but it's open to the general public, and it's designed as a first and last mile program connecting people to the broader fixed drought network. So trips have to occur within specific pre-designated zones, and they have to go to or from uh, a bus stop in order to qualify for, for the discount that the rider receives. And for that program, the fare is $2.00 and then we cover the next $8, and then any provider charge beyond that additional $8 or $10 total, the customer is responsible for. But what we've seen is that the majority of trips, because of their relatively short nature, the customers are just paying that flat uh, $2. Access Flex is a fourth program that we don't currently have, but it's recommended to be implemented as part of today's uh, discussion. And so we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail later. But essentially, under this program, WeGo could take certain trips that were booked as access trips, and the customer could give us permission on an ongoing basis to take the trips that they book with us, and essentially we convert them to access on-demand trips. And we'll talk about why we might want to do that uh, in a little bit as well. Let's see. I'll leave that there. So I did want to put up um, some of the uh, engagement activities that we went through um, on this slide and also talk about um, some of the feedback that we heard. So uh, we, we had a lot, of, a lot of customer engagement, mainly during um, the month of June is when we, when we targeted this engagement, but, but there's been other engagement throughout the project. And uh, one of the, there's a, there's a few things that we heard um, relatively consistently. One of the main takeaways was to have clear customer communication regarding these changes and to have an ongoing process to collect customer feedback uh, and adjust policy if needed, and also to make sure that any future technology changes included more customer self-service options. And we heard the term app. We want an app a lot of times. So we have one for fixed drought, right? We have, we have a lot for fixed drought. We advertise our real-time information and that's available but there's not a comparable service that's currently available for paratransit customers. Based on this feedback and also internal discussions, a few minor changes were made to the, um, the proposed uh, discussion items that we had in April. Um, and these changes are highlighted on pages 48 and 49 in the, in the printed packet. And I'd like to spend a little bit more time on some of the kind of high impact recommendations that we have um, included here, uh, the ones that specifically affect customers most significantly. So first, under the core access and ADA paratransit program changes, which are on the table on page 50, uh, let's talk about the, this access flex program. So this provides an option for customers to give WeGo permission to convert trips originally booked as access trips to access on-demand trips. And the advantages for the customer is that for those trips that we convert, the fare would be waived because some of those providers don't necessar won't necessarily be able to accept our fare media. So that's an advantage to the customer. Um, the travel times are generally going to be sore, potentially direct trips as opposed to group trips, and the reliability can be improved. And for the agency, overall, we can potentially reduce costs, but the bigger advantages are in service reliability overall, not just for the customers that are using the program, but also for those that aren't, because we're reducing the strain essentially on our system by freeing up some resources uh, on our vehicles to be able to serve our existing customers more reliably overall. Another significant change that's proposed under the access program is to enforce our no-show policy. And there's details regarding that no-show policy um, at the end of this item on page 52. But with the added step of requiring customers that have excessive no-shows to call and confirm trips in advance. Um, the idea being that this provides the customer another option to, um, for, us, for them to work with us to reduce no-shows before we get to a service suspension, which is the last thing that, that they want, and it's certainly the last thing that we want as well. 
Moving on to the potential change or the uh, recommend recommendations for the access on demand program, uh, which is on the next page, uh, we have proposed changes to the fare structure and that these what is this would essentially model the fare structure for the access on demand program off of the WeGo link model, which is there's a base fare and then WeGo pays us a certain amount up to a cap. And then the customers are responsible for anything beyond that cap for the fare. And so an example of that is included in the in the packet. Um, but you could have, um, let's say you have a fare, uh, total fare is $25. That's what the provider is charging. Customer would pay a flat $5 under this proposal. And then we go would pay the rest. Now, if the fare was $45, what we're proposing is a cap of $30 in terms of what we as the agency would pay for the trip. So the customer still pays $5. That's That would be the proposed base fare. And then we pay the next $30, which brings the total paid so far up to $35. And then the customer pays the remaining 10 for a total of $15. Now, it sounds a little bit complicated to explain initially, but once the customers are using it, it's relatively simple because they don't need to know Really, they don't need to know a fair structure other than they pay $5 and WeGo's going to cover the next 30. The rest of the fare is up to the provider and what the provider is charging. So if they're booking with a taxi provider, they're going to be paying taxi rates minus these the the subsidy that we're kicking in. Or if they're you know riding with a with a TNC like Uber, they're going to be riding on those rates and we'll cover this. We're going to cover the same amount regardless of whatever what provider they're riding with. And one of the main reasons we wanted to, to make this change was really to essentially reflect, uh, have the, the cost that uh, customers paying be more reflective of the cost of the service being provided. It's a customer choice program, which means customers can choose providers, but part of that choice should also be choosing how much they want to pay based on the service that, they, that they're looking for. And these changes, even though it's a, quite a, di a, a fairly different structure from what we have in place today, uh, the net change actually would be such that about half of customers would be paying a little bit less than they are currently under the under the, exi under the existing structure, and half would be paying more. So there's a few other changes uh, listed for both the access and access on demand programs, and I'm happy to take any questions on those. Um, but just for clarity, the recommendation today is to recommend to the board board for approval to propose policy changes to both the access and access on demand programs as detailed on tables one and two, which are on pages 50 and 51. And these changes are recommended to take, take effect on July 1st of 2024. That's a little ways out, but the reason we wanted to do that was because we wanted to provide plenty of time for customer education in response to that feedback that we received from customers. And we also wanted to provide adequate time to complete the procurement process for onboarding new providers and negotiating new provider contracts, which is something that Marilyn will touch on briefly in, in her next item as well. So that concludes uh, my summary here, and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, that was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'll throw it over this way for questions and maybe some of mine will get answered. That was a lot. Um, so can you go back to the slide that was just up? And, and this is just, um, uh, yeah, that top change to remove drug and alcohol testing requirements. We just heard that that was a finding in the triennial, triennial review. So I'm just curious how that works. Sure, I can definitely address that. There is something called the taxi voucher exemption, which has actually been in place for, for decades, I think, where public transit agencies, if they essentially provide subsidies to customers for them to go out and purchase their own transportation, and there's more than one provider available to choose from, then those providers do not necessarily have to meet all the same requirements that a contract service provider would with regards to drug and alcohol testing. And the reason for that is the idea behind those programs is essentially that we're, you can make a service more affordable for customers without the, the public, without the market and these service providers having to fundamentally alter their business rules. Got it. Got it. And, and we're already falling into that boat with WeGoLink. Because obviously you're not going to get Uber and Lyft into a program if you're going to require drug and alcohol testing. So, 
But I would emphasize Dan's point. It's user choice. If someone's not comfortable with that, they just stay in the, the existing access. In the right. access, right. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and you also mentioned that, um, I made a note, the app, the, the customer is asking for an app, which seems totally legitimate. Um, but you, And you said that there were no current, there were none currently available. And my question is, like anywhere or just to the WeGo access right consumer today? So a few years ago, the answer would have been anywhere, but there are emerging providers that are actually providing very customer friendly uh, apps. And so one of the non-policy items that we're looking at as a recommendation is implementing new technology. And that would absolutely be a requirement of any type of RFP or anything that we would put out to have that type of an application available for customers. Awesome. There, there are other compelling reasons to look at changing over our scheduling system, but that would be a significant item because the current provider does not offer that option. Yeah, I think um, scheduling through phone and email could get quite um, complex, it's, complicated. It's, it's 1980s. Do we yeah. still accept fax? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to say it, but yeah, thank Marilyn you. says yes, we do. <laughs> Hey, look, I'm, da phone? I'm dating myself, but I remember when that was the big innovation in paratransit scheduling. <laughs> Ooh, you can fax in your... <laughs> Thank you. All right, thanks. Any other questions? I have one. Um, on table one, final recommendation changes, core access, ADA par paratransit. The, um, the first one, it talks about the... Um, Provider Option Program Access Flex. Can you talk to that one more time again, exactly what that recommendation is? Sure. So that recommendation is essentially for customers who are already using the access on demand providers um, and potentially new providers under this program, any providers that they already are choosing to use under that program, that they would essentially give us permission to be able to send trips that they're booking under the regular access program, the next day service for the, the $3.70 service to allow us to essentially take those trips and send them to those providers, such as uh, you know, potentially Uber if they were involved. And some, that's something that we couldn't normally do because of the drug and alcohol requirements. But if the customer gives us permission, then it's a customer choice program and we can make those kinds of changes. Um, and, and again, there's, there's a few reasons for that, but the biggest is especially during peak times where the system can become resource constrained, it's helpful to be able to utilize as, met, as much available capacity as you can. You, you may have a run at, at peak time when there's a ton of trips happening, you might get a request for a trip that's like 20 miles out and it's going to chew up an hour and a half of the van's time. So from an efficiency standpoint, that really pulls down reliability and efficiency. And again, it's user choice. If somebody doesn't want to be involved, they don't have to sign up. But the incentive is we'll waive the fare if you, you know, if you sign up and let us decide when it makes more sense for us to put you on another carrier or put you in our van. And obviously, um, we match up, you know, if someone's in a wheelchair and an alternate provider can't offer wheelchair, except we're not going to put them on that provider. Just got a follow-up question. Does it, does that then put more um, workload on, I guess, the WeGo staff in order to determine who that other provider might be? Um, not necessarily. The WeGo staff already have to do that. They're either deciding to put uh, the trip on our vehicles and then finding a place in the schedule for it or deciding to send it to one of our third-party contractors that does meet the FTA drug and alcohol testing and other training requirements. So they essentially have to do that step already. They just have another choice, another bucket that they can put the trip in. And it's also one of the other factors we talk about when we're looking at replacing our scheduling system. You know, the, the app is one and also just more adaptability to what the, what the operational environment is. I like that. I think the new software system would be very helpful for the access ride program. Okay, can you make sure that's in the minutes, Monica? Because when they see the price tag, <laughs> I know when I see the price tag, capital might plan next month, but... they might not be as enthusiastic. <laughs> I remember, Dan. Do you remember what my reaction was when you showed it to me? <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you go into it. <laughs> well, given that, okay. can... yeah.
<laughs> if, if I may, Madam Chair, can I ask a couple more questions? You may. Because we, you're asking us to vote on approving these changes, right, to the policy. So I just want to make sure when I vote that I'm casting my vote knowing, knowing what I'm voting for. So um, on table one, again, there's, there are two things there that I just want to, to hear a little more about. If, and that's the enforcing of the no-show policy. I know that we had one already. We heard that months ago when KFH was here, but we weren't enforcing it. So in, in the packet, there, there is kind of a stepped process of that. I think you've done a great job of explaining that, so I appreciate that, but I just want to know everyone to know we're voting on that. And then the other one is the paratransit IDs, and this is the first time seeing that. Can you explain that to me, please? Sure. The basic idea with the, uh, and, and I can address the no-show policy briefly, that change, just for clarity, and it's on the last page of this particular action item, so I think it's uh, 52. Um, at the bottom, there's a summary of the no-show policy as it currently stands, and uh, below that uh, first bulleted list, um, so the, the last bulleted list there, there's a highlighted item, the second, the second row there, the second bullet, where it says second monthly occurrence require trip confirmation calls. That's the specific change that's being recommend, recommended, where essentially we're the, the above bulleted list is the current sequence of progressive action, and that's the recommended sequence, and that's an excerpt directly from the policy as it's currently written. So the consumer or customer would call and confirm, or would your team call and confirm with the consumer or cons customer? The customer would call and confirm with us. And then if we didn't receive a confirmation call, then the trip would be canceled. Would they be notified? Yeah. Okay. And the and big issue with, with no-shows is it factors into service reliability because when you're scheduling a van, particularly at those peak times, and they go, you know, and they may have other people on the van, and you go and you sit at the apartment for 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and nobody comes out, um, it's disruptive. It, it certainly hurts efficiency, but it also hurts service quality when they're 20 minutes late to the next pickup and the person who's already on the van is 20 minutes late getting to wherever they're going to. I, I get it. I, I'm pro And policy, I think, but... correct me if I'm wrong, Dan or Marilyn, most of where we have a problem is with the subscription trips. So you, you can have a trip set up. I want to go to work Monday through Friday, pick me up here, you know, return me here. And that's a regular, they don't have to schedule that every day. It's not an on-demand trip. So, you know, you decide, oh, I'm going to take Thursday off, and you just forget to call. So that, that's where a bunch of them tend to happen, if I'm Thank remembering you. correctly. Yeah, and, and, and those are, I'm not going to say easy to address, but in some ways easier because we can work with those customers and say, hey, we notice you haven't been taking your subscription regularly. We're going to stop the subscription for now, but you can still take right. the trips. Just book them ahead of time. Okay. Thank you. And what about the paratransit IDs? This is something that um, is pretty... I won't say it's completely standard practice. Everybody, every agency does paratransit a little bit differently. But it's pretty common. And the idea here is essentially that if a customer is using the service, that they have some type of card that has their picture on it so that you know that the customer who's actually getting onto the vehicle is the one who's who, who booked the trip and the one who's a uh, account it was booked under and so there's a couple of, of reasons for that first um i think the most important is really just has to do with um potentially the potential for mistakes and confusion we pick up at a lot of locations where we have upwards of a dozen people getting on uh multiple vehicles at the same time um not quite as many as we used to um uh pre-covid but we still do this from time to time and this can help to avoid individuals getting onto the wrong vehicle. Um, second, it does help with reducing the potential for fraud in terms of, and the most, um, the most common would be essentially a family member riding under the family member's account who's been approved for access even though they are not. And again, it's, it's difficult to say if that's very prevalent right now because there's not a good way to essentially um, police it. But it does put something in place to, to help guard against that. 
And then the last is this is a really good way just to get a quick ticket into everyone's hands. So these IDs would also be quick ticket. Okay, great. And Thanks. this would not be implemented until quick tickets fully available in the access system. That was quite comprehensive. Um, well, I, I, it only I, took I, us two and a half years. I know, because we've been talking about this for a very long time. So I guess I asked the same question. So how do we how do we communicate this effectively to our customers and maybe even to our drivers um, in a way that is clear and concise and easy to follow? I will, um, I'll give a couple of items that I know that we can do, and I think this would probably, and we're going to put together a whole communications plan around okay. this, but worth additional um, discussion and maybe a presentation at some point um, regarding how we're going to reach out to customers, but we have some tools available to us. So first, of course, we have the vehicles. Um, we can put messaging on the vehicles themselves, either on the inside or the outside. Um, we also have... Uh, the addresses and phone numbers of all of these individuals. We have done direct mailers before and for something this significant, we don't like to clutter their mailboxes, but for something this significant, I think that would be appropriate. Um, and we can do those um, such that we get, if we get an error for the return address, we know it as well. Um, and uh, and there, there's a couple of other items, uh, other ways we can reach out, especially reaching out to um, the agencies and facilities that serve a lot of these customers, dialysis clinics, medical centers, et cetera, um, and, and having them help us to get the word out as sort of a distributed method has also been helpful in the past. Awesome. Access tends to be easier because we know who everybody is. Fixed her out, yeah. you know, yep. you come, you yeah. pay your $2, and we never know who you were. That's great. Great work. Thank you. So I know you have a request from our um, board. So I was wondering if any of our board members have any response to that by way of a motion. Sorry, I move to approve the um, policy changes to the access right program. As recommended by the staff. As recommended by the staff, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any further discussion? Any more questions before we let Dan go? Well done. Uh, with no further questions, a motion and a second, uh, I will call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Good job. I think, I think our customers will be happy with this. A long way from fax machines. <laughs> or rotary phones. Or... <laughs> All those other good things. Marilyn, you're up. Welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And and hi and welcome and welcome all, all all the new board members. I'm happy to be here today. Um, I'm going to piggyback off Dan. I was going to go into the difference in access and access on demand, but he's already taken care of that for me. So I'll jump I'll jump right into my item. Um, as Dan made clear, we contract out a portion of our access services and access on demand to third party contractors. In September of 18, I came before the board and we awarded a contract to four providers at that time. At that time, we, uh, we awarded the contract for three years and in 2021, we did exercise our optional years four and five. The total not to exceed for the initial contract was $20 million, and then we added an additional $14 million when we exercised our optional years. Um, right now, we have three providers under contract. One of the providers did cease operations in the state of Tennessee in 2020, so uh, that, that contract was terminated. Uh, as Dan said, we've been working with KFH now for almost two years on the access Im Im improvement study. And part of that was we actually asked them to help us develop the RFPs for uh, our access core service and our access, and our access choice programs. Um, because we just became to, to, to the board, and I thank you for approving all those policies. You just made, made me smile big. Um, it, there has been a delay in getting our RFPs out. Our current contracts actually are set to expire next month. Uh, we don't have any additional options to exercise. 
but um, we, we did put a notice to publish uh, on our website in June. This notice was to allow our current providers what, what is coming in the new RFPs. One of the differences is we're going to split it in two. So one RFP for all, all those choice programs and one RFP for our core program, which is, has the drug, the alcohol, the ADA, all those good 200 pages of FTA regulations that, that you have to have to have that program. Um, then, so because of that, uh, I'm, at, I'm going to ask the board, in order to maintain our current levels of paratransit service to a level that our, that our customers actually are expecting now, one of the benefits of the pandemic, we've actually improved our on-time performance for access. And a lot of that is because we, we have partnered really well with our third-party contractors. They've helped us with capacity when we've had some manpower issues. They, 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 they've helped us when we had some vehicle issues. So we've developed a really good partnership with the ones that we have now. Uh, I, I have spoken to our third-party contractors. They are aware I am here today for this ask. All, all three part, all three contractors are on board with e extending the contract. So my ask is to extend our current contracts through June 30th, 2024. That's in line with the uh, policies that, that we're going to put in place. And uh, with that, I'll open it up to any questions. I think the original agenda item might have said March 31st. So we also asked by amendment that that be changed to June 30th. Mm -hmm. And one of, the, frankly, one of the reasons is we're kind of hitting folks with a lot at a time. Um, October 1st, we have the quick ticket changes going into effect, plus our regular fall service changes, which aren't super radical. In January, we're going to be replacing the escalators at Central. In March and April, we're going to be doing spring service changes, which are pretty major. So frankly, we don't, just don't want to overwhelm people, both staff and customers with all sorts of changes up ahead of that time so so the official ask the or the amendment would be if we could extend through june 30th 2024. Are, are we sure that the extension through june 30th gives you enough time versus just making it a full she, year to I, she's good I, it is good that was the same question you asked me last week when i said march march 30th um, these, these are, these are actually now that our policy changes have been approved, they're actually in their final draft st stages. So they will hit the street with, with within the coming weeks. Okay. So and we're hoping to have them published, um, by shortly after Labor Day. So then we will start to have the proposals come back in October and November. That gives us plenty of time to vet. And any new contractors that may come on board. We've had a lot of interest over the last couple of years, especially for some smaller contractors that operate here in, in Nashville. They kind of want a piece of this access pie. So that's one of the reasons why we're making the changes to the access on demand program, because it does open it up. And if, if Walter was here, he would be smiling big because he's <laughs> one of the ones that's been pushing these smaller contractors to come on board. Okay. I just want to make sure you have enough time yeah with the extension through June yeah. 30th. I, I do believe right, right now okay. we would expect to probably come before you in January, February with a contract award and that still gives us two, three, four months to actually do the onboarding of the contractors and you know under the assumption that we'll probably get all or most of the existing contractors mm -hmm. that it can be a pretty seamless transition and then we can focus on the, the policy changes that Dan articulated. Any, any further questions? Yeah, can you speak to how um, the, the the provider that is no longer operating in Tennessee, how that affected ridership or anything? Uh, luckily, it was we were reduced ridership at that time because, as you can see, it was September 2020. So at that time, we were doing our best to keep our providers whole. Um, actually, that particular provider stopped operations in April of 2020. So they were not servicing any trips. So it was very seamless. Our other three providers had already picked up the slack. I will say, and I have to give credit to folks like Marilyn and Dan, that they had the foresight that we actually did a competitive solicitation earlier on. Because prior to the contract she mentioned that went in place in, in 2018, we only had one provider, and that was the one provider. So, so we would have been hurting big time 
if um, if they had made that change in the operation of the program. Are there any further questions? Still a lot better than rent mobility checks. <laughs> I was I was around then. <laughs> it, it provides just really good opportunity for our riders and for you to sort of have a better way of providing customer service that aligns with our mission. So I think that's it's, it's great growth. Well, thank you. Well, having no more questions, I would recommend that the board extend contract two zero one seven eight one zero. Um, starting from S September 21, 2023 through June 30th, 2024. Is there a motion to adopt the recommendation of staff? All right, I'll try my best. Um, I ask for a motion to approve extension of contract 2017810 um, till March to June 30th of 2024. Our staff recommendation. I second that motion. They're a lot quicker than you were, Jess. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take that. I thank absolutely. you. Let's check the tape. <laughs> uh, you were absolutely marvelous. This is thank great. You. So, um, dream come true for a board chair. So, uh, I have a motion and I have a second. And um, based upon staff, uh, great recommendation so is there any further comments questions hearing none i will call for the vote all those in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. thank there you have. thank you great job great great progress um next i will have margaret uh present the amendments to procedure for participation Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, this is an amendment to our procedures for, uh, for participation in MTA board meetings. Um, and this just applies to board meetings. Uh, because there are going to be some major initiatives coming before the board that we're expecting more community participation. And because there was a statute passed by the General Assembly effective July 1 that dealt with public participation and board governing bodies. Uh, it was a good time to take a look at our policies and that's what you have before you today. It's just a page and a half, uh, rather simple policy. The state statute provided that, uh, that you may have to notify and make sure the public knows that they have an opportunity to come to each board, each public meeting that you have. And the statute provided that you could limit the number of speakers, you could limit it what to what the person talks to, to you know, the agenda, uh, you can limit the minutes, you could do a, a number of things. This board in the past has not limited what comments are about. You allow everybody to come and talk about anything they want to talk about, and we have never limited the number of speakers. And so the policy that's before you is really a broad policy to allow a lot of conversation, but it does set forth for the public to know how they can comment uh, at the MTA board meeting. And instead of some policies which provide that you have to let the body know a day or so before or so, so much time limit before. Your policy does not do that. It says you just show up, you can uh, arrive here, and the public can comment. But you're asking in this um, uh, public comment um, uh, policy to have them have a uh, read this short policy and say that they understand it and that is done by other public bodies too because in putting this together I did look at other metro public bodies and, and uh, others to look to see what you have done in the past what I thought the culture was here and then uh, put something down in writing for you to review so um, whereas some public bodies ask you to say your name and address when you're talking before you were just asking people to give their name because this public comment uh, sheet, sign-in sheet, will have them give that information if you ever need it and want to get in touch with them. And then there are rules that are set out here. Mostly it's just about the two-minute time limit, uh, starting by saying their name. They don't have to speak the full time. They don't give their time to someone else. And how to be respectful uh, while they're 
talking with you and not to expect you that you are going to respond. And then there's some enforcement uh, rules there in case there's anybody that does violate the proceedings. So, Madam Chair, unless there are any questions to you or to me about that, then this would just need a motion from the board to approve. Um, thank you, Ms. Bell. I do appreciate your um, pulling this together and also your looking around to um, make certain that we are aligned with others in, in Metro and beyond. So thank you for doing that. Are there any questions for Ms. Bell? Hearing none, is there a motion? motion? Yes, I move to approve the amendment to procedures for participation in the MTA uh, board meetings, public meetings. Thank you. Is there a second? I second. There's a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing no further discussion, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 And motion carries. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that concludes the operations and find no <laughs> new initiatives and community engagement committee. See what happens when you don't do committees. You just sort of forget how to do it. I don't know. Uh, so I'll turn to you, Mr. Bland. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, uh, welcome, you, Iran. Uh, great to have you on board. Believe me, we're going to be picking your brain on a lot of issues uh, coming down the road here. I'll keep my report brief because I know we've been running a little bit long on time. Um, I will tell you, uh, last month you approved a uh, sequence of service changes to go into effect on October 1st, so we're well underway in getting ready for those changes and service improvements. Uh, we got one off to an early start. The um, Route 70 Bellevue connector was initiated a few weeks back, uh, you know, to coincide with the start of the school year. So we put it in place as a pilot service because we didn't have the time to do the Title VI analysis and the public engagement process that you know. Um, we always go through. So you will see it again in the spring 2024 changes, and we'll run it through that process at that time. Overall, it's been running fine. I think we had some issues uh, in the first week because of traffic uh, and other conditions down in the Lawson High School area. I think every, everybody was excited to go see the new school, and I mean everybody uh, was excited to go see uh, the new school. But that seems to be um, working itself out to a large extent. Um, so, so far, so good. Um, Want to call out Kia Lewis. Work continues at a good pace on the Ernest Rick Patton Jr. North Nashville Transit Center. In fact, next month we'll have Kia come and do a presentation with slides, uh, with pictures um, at your meeting. This coming, this next Tuesday evening, we're going to be hosting a public meeting at the Lee Chapel AME Church on Dr. D.B. Todd Boulevard to gain input from the community, specifically on the art installations. As, as you know, we awarded a contract to the Hardin Group to coordinate our um, the artistic presence there. Um, artists have been selected, and now, um, and there was a kind of a core theme that the uh, architects and designers had in the center. So now we're in the process of executing on that, which in my history with these types of projects is always good news because it means that the actual completion is sort of on the horizon. Um, and getting closer, not further away. Um, I've attended several meetings with everybody, Metro Planning, Mayor's Office, others regarding the um, Global Mall Redevelopment process. Metro Planning has issued their Global Mall Redevelopment Vision Plan. It's out for public comment now. Um, our planned transit center as part of that development um, is part of the plan, and it's essentially in the same spot we wanted it originally so we should be able to uh, move forward a little bit more quickly on that project and i will be sending a notification to all the members but on september 12th we're going to be hosting an event at the southeast community center down there um, our fta regional administrator that taylor is coming into town to do the big check presentation uh, we were successful again thanks to billy higgins billy you are going to let me know two years ahead of your retirement right uh, we were successful in getting a competitive federal um, bus capital facilities grant of $5 million toward the, toward the construction of that. And we're up to um, $17.5 million toward that project. We will need more, um, but I have every confidence that we'll get it. And also present at that event will be Mayor Cooper and uh, Deputy Governor and Secretary T. Butch Ely again. So um, told Butch he's going to get used to coming to transit project uh, events. Um, very pleased again, recognition of Iran. Very pleased to attend. 
I don't usually say this about Metro Council meetings, but I was very pleased to uh, attend the Metro Council Rules and Nominations Committee and the full council meeting uh, this past month when Iran was, uh, was appointed to the MTA board. He slid through even easier than you did, Catherine. So, uh, so you, so you both are in, are you're in, you're in good shape. Um, you may have noticed we're, we're a little bit running a little bit late in presenting you with our capital improvement plan. We do an annual capital improvement plan. So when folks like Carl come in and ask you for a whole bunch of money for buses, you kind of know what the basis of that is. But um, off of her successful and highly triumphant FTA triennial review, Billy Higgins has been hard at work um, compiling a lot of that, that planning document. So we do expect to be bringing something to you in September. Um, I was pleased to be selected to participate in the 2023-2024 class of Leadership Tennessee. So we had our kickoff um, retreat, I guess, is what they would call it, a couple weeks ago. A pretty impressive group. I'm not sure how I slid in. A um, couple state senators, a couple county mayors. And I think what would be really cool is from, from Nashville, um, Dr. White from MDHA is in the class. Dr. Battle from MNPS is in the class and the uh, relatively new CEO from Nashville Electric Services in the class. So we've already been chatting Nashville infrastructure issues. Um, the director of the program made us promise that we'd mingle with the rest of the state every now and then. So, so that's been going on. Um, I put at your tables uh, some background information on the East Bank uh, vision plan and the role that um, transit, which is a very prominent role, will be playing as that process emerges and I say process more than more so than project because it's probably a sequence of about 200 projects uh, but again I want to call out uh, to attention Lucy Kempf director of Metro planning and her staff for the outstanding work they did in the overall program and certainly in designing transit in from the ground up as opposed to you know frankly what we've seen a lot is if something happens then as an after oh yeah can you come in and throw a bus stop up where there's really no room to do it so we're very excited to be doing that um, and then I'll just turn to the RTA side uh, for a bit Hatch Consulting is continuing their work on the star future vision study we completed the first phase of public engagement they're drafting various scenarios to be modeled modeled financially operationally capital investment uh, decisions and then going out for a, for a second wave of public engagement overall we have we had very good participation some places more than others but I think, Felix, there were, what, a couple thousand surveys submitted? 1,200? Um, so, so good engagement on that. Continuing to advance work on negotiations for our joint development project at the RTA's Donaldson Station site. Over time, that will engage the MTA because we are anticipating the creation of one of our transit centers at that location as we look to build up a more robust route network. But in the meantime, we've been working with the developers on the various due diligence due diligences that have to be done, as well as we've initiated conversations with Metro Planning and NDOT to look at a relocation of a signalized intersection along uh, Donaldson Pike to make our operations there easier and frankly to manage because you actually will have two complementary develops, the one on one on the station site, one across the street and the old Donaldson Bowl site so there's an op opportunity for that to become a much more um, dense use um, we're also working toward land acquisition we keep sneaking along for a permanent park and ride location in murfreesboro so we're very optimistic that that's moving through and right now we're engaged with the federal transit administration on all of our environmental reviews finally maybe the best news of all um, the felix castrodad project um, starting on September 30th, we're going to be initiating um, service to Nashville SC games, the last four games, four home games they have of the year, September 30th, October 4th, October 14th, and October 21. We're piloting it out of Murfreesboro and Antioch, so there'll be a stop at our park and ride in Murfreesboro. There'll be a stop at the Global Mall site in Antioch, and then right into the Nashville SC games. And I really want to um, credit and thank the team um, who was very um, active with us in doing things like surveying their ticket holders and working with us on site deployment and then i specifically want to acknowledge um, katie and felix 
for putting together um, a, a really viable service plan. So we'll see how it goes. And, and the goal would be to learn a lot of lessons and do some good stuff this year with an eye toward trying to expand that service and partnership next year. So unless there are any questions, Madam Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you, Steve. Any questions for Steve? Any comments? I do want to make a comment. Thanks for bringing the book. Um, note, page 12, there's a quote by me. <laughs> and she will talk about her again, huh? <laughs> I also hear you pretty prominently uh, shown in the video, uh, too. So. Oh, I haven't seen the video. Is there a video? There's a video. Page 12? <laughs> page 12. Page 12? At the top. Right there. Nice. Congratulations, Jessica. That's amazing. I had one question, Steve, and it's uh, just you mentioned earlier the increase in ridership because of the resumption of school, kids going back in school. And I assume at some point as I continue forward, we'll get some. I'm just curious about sort of the number of riders of whether it's kids or teachers that take advantage Spe of transit. Specifically at Lawson, Catherine, or in general? Uh, in, in general. I'm yeah. just interested in learning. We can do a, um, we can do a stride report. I, I always caution against the first, looking too early in the school year because, you have, you have, like, I assume that a lot of the traffic at Lawson that first week was every parent wanted to drop their kid um, at school, you know, who may take have other means. But we... Um, we work with Metro National Schools on what we call the STRIDE program. So every public school student, whether it be public schools, charter schools, magnet schools, has free high school level has free access to all of our services. And that's seven days a week, 12 months a year, it isn't specifically for school. So we track that data pretty closely, and we have boarding counts by school. So it's probably probably a good time for us to update, you know, do some sort of a presentation to the board on what the status of that is, because it, it's definitely still different post pandemic. We saw more, much more sluggish. We've seen a much more sluggish recovery of our student ridership than in some of the other sectors. I'd love to hear and see some of that That's just as we move easy forward. To do. We will definitely do that. Great job, Steve. I was going to talk about Felix in the commercial and being the number one fan for the national side and bringing that love uh, into the work you do. So well done. Commercials, everything. Just just rock star today. Felix, how about you? Commer and Jessica. Commercials in the U of A. <laughs> <laughs> she really was. She really was. She overshadowed you. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> It's all right, though. It's all about family, though, so it's good, though. Well, well done, though, today, Felix, on so many things. But you've been that way for quite a while, so thank you. Billy, you know you're always a rock star, so thank you for your presentation. Thank you for helping us get those other grant dollars and just being steadfast. She's the only profit center in the company. Only profit center. <laughs> That's power in that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> There is. Um, so, hey, Ron and Catherine, welcome again, and just happy to have you here. Jessica, well done as chair. Thank you for stepping in when asked to do so. Appreciate that very much. And um, so I don't I don't have a lot, but uh, I, I know a Ron and Catherine probably don't know, but prior to your coming on the board, we did uh, an evaluation, and we do a CEO evaluation every year, and we did one of Steve this year, and of course, as you would expect, it was an exemplary evaluation. And uh, as a result of that, I began working with uh, Margaret to sort of look at where we were with Steve with his uh, employment contract, and as a result, I'm going to turn it over to you again, Margaret, to talk about uh, an, uh, an amendment of his employment Thank agreement. You. Thank you. Thank you. So Steve came on board as MTA CEO in 2014, and it seems like every three years we come before the board and take a particular look at his contract. Uh, it's the custom for the chair after evaluation to talk with Steve and look at the contract. And so this year, what you have on your action item is just the background of the changes that have been made uh, since 2014. And that was when his contract was entered into. And then there was an amendment in 2017 and then amendment in 2020. 
So there is a proposed amendment now here for 2023. These amendments would be effective back to the beginning of the fiscal year, which is July 1, 2023. The first one is to extend his contract, which has occurred in the other times that we've amended the contract through December 31st, 2028. And then also uh, the chair has proposed that his base salary be increased by 5% his annual vacation days increased to 30 days. And then beginning July 1, 2024, that he get an automatic increase of 3% every year on the salary. If the Metro, he is a Metro employee, if Metro gives its employees a cost of living raise that is more than 3%, for that one year, he would get that cost of living raise. Otherwise, it's 3% every year in annual increase. There are two provisions about life insurance and uh, deferred compensation uh, that will be changed and deleted. Uh, and then he further proposes, uh, and the chair agreed, that his professional dues that had not been increased since 2014 be increased to 3500 a year. Uh, and then, really due to his outstanding performance in the past three years, and particularly just noting during the pandemic and the evaluations that he received, the chair is proposing that he get a one-time bonus of $10,000. And Mr. Bland is agreeable to all of these changes. So I am looking for a motion uh, from someone on the board to approve the proposed amendment of the agreement that the chair proposes. And then I will draft an amendment number three to his contract and Mr. Bland and I will work back and forth until it's satisfactory to both of us. I move to approve um, the amendment to uh, CEO's employment agreement. Second. Do I move this one or do you? No, and you can now take oh, it from okay. here okay. And, and see if there are any more questions or whatever you do. <laughs> You're such a, such a whatever I do. <laughs> well, <laughs> Madam Secretary, thank, thank, thank you so much. You know, every now and then when we do something just a little bit different, I always go to you to make certain that I'm doing it exactly right. And I appreciate thank the you. good guidance you always give me. So we have a motion and we have a second. Is there any further discussion? Yeah, can I commend Steve's uh, leadership? Yes. Through uh, the pandemic and continuing on, I'm I'm so glad that we get to extend his, and he's agreeable to extending his contract <laughs> 2028, um, because I uh, I think that WeGo has seen a lot of updates and upgrades, um, even without dedicated funding like the like other peer cities and bigger cities have. And I think he's done just a great job and has a great team, um, and I'm excited for the next five years. And, and, and I would agree with that. And I think one other thing that happened during um, the pandemic is that we did a lot of uh, um, Zoom stuff. So I ended up being on a couple conversations with Steve nationwide. And it, it's it's wonderful to sit there and know that your your director is so revered nationally, where, you know, we sort of sit in, in this little valley right here. And we don't always see that. But to see the kind of respect um, that his colleagues across the country have is good for our system. And it's it's good for us to acknowledge that in him and know that we are fortunate to have that kind of director. And uh, his leadership just shines all the time. And looking, again, I agree, you know, the work of staff and being able to respond to this type of leadership is extraordinary and, and good for the agency as well. So Steve, uh, I guess I'll call for the vote. What do you think? <laughs> Sounds good. And I would just say, um, first of all, I'm glad you acknowledge the staff because we don't mm -hmm. do any of this stuff without them. Um, hopefully I try to put them in a position to be successful. And this board has been amazing um, in terms of being supportive of advancements. And I know not to interpret Jessica's comments as, well, we don't need dedicated funding because we do. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I would also uh, say, buckle up. We got some pretty exciting things coming up. We go, we go right. We go, but anyhow, all those, <laughs> that didn't come out right. I wanted it to, but it just didn't. <laughs> so we have a motion and we have a second. If there's no further conversation, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We have a, we, we have an employment, uh, amendment of employment agreement. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Steve.
Margaret, thank you so much for, for all of your work. And um, that concludes my report. Uh, is there any other business? Hearing none, uh, how about we adjourn? Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the heat. <laughs>